my medical school applications, I could write a whole book about. I did 72 applications. I didn't know, I had no one advising me. I didn't know that the state universities would not accept anybody from out of state. So I uh, applied probably to 60 too many schools or 50 too many schools. But anyway, I got into Einstein. And fortunately at Einstein, uh, the head of the diabetes, the clinical director of the diabetes center, Sam Rosen, was, believed in blood sugar control but didn't know how to do it. And he uh, supported my application. Uh, he ended up uh, doing uh, my thing with his patients and seeing remarkable results. And uh, I wanted to, I didn't know whether I would survive medical school. I was 45 years old, had diabetes for uh, 33 years or so, and I didn't know whether I was going to live through medical school. So I had this compulsion to write a book to disclose how to do it. And uh, with Sam's help, uh, we actually got the Diabetes Center at Einstein to put their imprimatur on the cover of the book. I was called a consultant to the Diabetes Center, and that enabled me to get a publisher, Crown Publishing. So we published that book, and it, uh, I wrote it during my first year in medical school, and it was published at the end of my second year. I then went into practice and uh, rapidly learned about how to, the treatment of type 2 diabetes, which I knew nothing about. My first book was about type 1 diabetes. And what did I see? They were all snackers. Uh, someone uh, would come in who had read my second book, which was Diabetes Type 2, and said, I'm on your diet, uh, but I can't get my uh, A1C under 6. And uh, I would say, uh, let's take a look at what you're currently eating. And every new patient has to give me a list of their current meals. And lo and behold, the great bulk of these people were on what looked like low-carbohydrate diet, but they were eating nuts, snacking on nuts. Some of them were on more benign nuts, like macadamia. Some of them were on very sweet ones, like cashews. Uh, uh, yet they all managed to get their A1Cs up. And uh, I had a chronic problem of dealing with carbohydrate craving. Now, why do people have carbohydrate craving? Is it just uh, something wrong with their psyche? That's what most of them thought. That's what my wife thought. She was a psychiatrist. But I was convinced that it was something physiological. And I, by the time of my second book, I knew about amylin. How many people here know about amylin? Okay, we only a small number. This is an extremely important hormone. It's made by the beta cells of the pancreas, the same cells that make insulin. It is the major satiety hormone of the body. It's what stops you from getting hungry after you had a meal. Now, the way that amylin is made goes something like this. A person eats a handful of pebbles. It could be any solid food that gets into the intestines and distends them. When the intestines are distended, they make hormones and neurotransmitters. Uh, the intestines are called the second brain because there are more known hormones and neurotransmitters made by the intestines than made by the brain. And one of the uh, hormones is called GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide number one. That gets into the bloodstream, tells the pancreas, hey, there's food down here, you better make insulin before this guy's blood sugar goes up. Okay. Well, what most doctors don't realize is that human insulin 
is unbelievably potent. I have a little bottle of human insulin out on the table there, called regular. Uh, one unit of that will lower my blood sugar by 40. But that's diluted 25-fold, which means that one unit of pure human insulin will lower blood sugar by, what's 25 times 40? Anyone know? It's a thousand. Okay? One unit, if I passed around my insulin syringe, you can hardly see. It's less than a millimeter on the syringe. So this tiny amount will lower blood sugar by a thousand means that humans have to somehow offset their own production of insulin by fine-tuning it. And those of you who had the old-fashioned television sets with the two tuning knobs, one, you point, set a pointer at the station and it's noisy and fuzzy, and then you turn the other one round and round and round a lot of times, you, you home in on the station. Same thing with shortwave radios. So, the human body has a fine-tuning hormone, glucagon, that's made by the alpha cells of the pancreas, which are not destroyed in diabetes. Now, the alpha, the glucagon is much weaker than insulin. Let's say it's a tenth as strong as insulin. So it's not quite weak enough to give you 50 turns. You only get 10 turns. There's another hormone that makes the body less sensitive to glucagon so that you could get maybe 100 turns and get real fine tuning. This is in non-diabetic humans. That other hormone is called amylin. It's made by the beta cells. Amylin has three major properties. It's the satiety hormone. It offsets the effects of glucagon, and it slows stomach emptying. What's the advantage to slowing stomach emptying? So that our answer, the, excuse me? Improved control. Improved control. Well, uh, we're talking about non-diabetics, okay? And if you look at our ancestors, let's say the guys on the block 10, 15,000 years ago, uh, down to woolly mammoth, and they think they're going to eat the whole thing. If they could eat the whole thing, it would screw up their metabolism for reasons that you'll see their blood sugars would go up, et cetera, et cetera. But by slowing stomach emptying, once they're making amylin, they can't eat anymore. They don't feel like it because of its effect on the satiety in the brain, and they uh, physically can't handle it because their stomach emptying has slowed. Now, diabetics have lost, full diabetics like me, have lost all of their beta cells. In, I put that in quotes because it's not quite true. Um, type 2 diabetics are still making insulin, but they can't make enough insulin and they can't make enough amylin. So, you give me anything that distends the gut, like a handful of pebbles or you pump some air in my intestines, uh, I will get GLP-1, I cannot make amylin, I can, cannot make insulin, but I can make glucagon, unobstructed glucagon, so my blood sugar goes up. And it can go up a lot, depending upon how much I distend my gut. So, uh, when I said before that the most benign foods can still affect blood sugar control in a diabetic, this is very apparent. Now, uh, protein, can be converted directly to glucose via gluconeogenesis. And a study at, uh, uh, published in um, one of the nutrition journals about 10 years ago showed that the maximum conversion that anyone can achieve is uh, 36%, not the old 52% that we used to talk about.